livid. Livid. I've come to Barcelona. Uh, I thought I was going to be making a lovely vlog today. I was going to get out on the skateboard, go and have a look around Barcelona in the sunshine with an afternoon to myself. Really excited about it. But no, I'm in Barcelona. My bag is in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Now that's bad enough. It's got everything in it. It's got my skateboard. It's got all my clothes. I mean, literally everything. It's got my laptop charger in it. My laptop is going to run out of battery very soon. That means that I don't even know when you're going to see this vlog because without the laptop being powered up, I can't even edit it. I can't do anything. So I'm absolutely mad. Not only that that bag has now gone and I knew when I checked in back at uh, Gatwick and I, I checked the bag in, I knew the, the guy that was from EasyJet that was checking it in, I could tell he didn't know what he was doing at the time. Uh, you know, lovely guy, but wasn't confident in what he was doing. Uh, and now, you know, what he's done is he's stuck the wrong sticker on the bag and it's gone off to Belfast. Um, on top of that, EasyJet, um, I, I mean, I'm, this is not a complaint about budget airlines at all. I promise you it isn't. I've flown loads and loads of budget airlines with no problem ever. Most of the time, um, certainly coming to F1 races, we tend to fly British Airways. They're very, very good. The customer service is absolutely great. And if there's ever a problem, which there have been on occasions, they have dealt with it in a very, very, you know, reputable way. They've been super helpful uh, and made the pain as, as minimal as possible. EasyJet, I'm really sorry, this has not been a good experience. What I've been told is um, that the, the flight, they don't know which flight it will eventually get back to Barcelona, so it may come in tomorrow, tomorrow evening at nine o'clock. Um, if it misses that one, then it'll be some point on Friday. But even if it lands tomorrow night, Thursday night at nine o'clock, the, the airport here can't get me the bag until Friday because everybody finishes work by that point. That's not good enough. That is not good enough. I need that bag the moment it lands. Send somebody out to my hotel. We're only down the road uh, or in the city, not, not a million miles away. And on top of that, because I now need to go and buy clothes and toiletries and probably a laptop charger to be able to do my job, I need to go and spend some money. So, you know, OK, I thought I'll get a bundle of cash to go off and do those things. No, I've just been given a piece of paper that says I'm entitled to spend £25 assuming my bag arrives within 48 hours which it will do by Friday hopefully 25 pounds is all I'm allowed to spend 25 quid for two days how on earth am I supposed to get by on that having bought clothes and I mean a laptop charger costs three times that in itself I mean unbelievable I'm so angry so angry thing is EasyJet that customer service is everything I understand that problems happen I understand mistakes happen and sometimes bags get lost flights get delayed things go wrong that's all normal that happens with the very best and the most expensive airlines but the way you deal with those problems is how you know is the reputation of your company and I'm sorry but you've dealt with this badly my bag went to the wrong place through somebody's mistake your mistake and yet, in terms of dealing with me, you haven't been helpful. I've had to wait ages at the desk there for somebody to turn up, because there's just nobody in the airport. And then secondly, when he did turn up, I get given this information that isn't really very helpful. I now have to go online and, and register all my details and, and collect receipts and claim expenses up to the value of £25. It's not good enough, EasyJet. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> I lost my bags at the airport, so now I'm angry. <laughs> I need to buy uh, clothes and also um, like a, a, a charger for my laptop. Okay, yes. Is there somewhere nearby? Yes. Okay. So around the back of here? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay, time for a very quick room tour. In fact, it won't take very long because it's a small room. Uh, here we go. This is a new hotel for me. Not stayed here before, but um, <laughs> look. that's pretty much it. <laughs> Not too much to show you this time. Bathroom. Yeah, pretty basic, um, but that's fine. What more do you need? Lovely view of a motorway. But actually, no, the view that way is not too bad, is it? I reckon, uh, 
you may well see a time lapse sunrise or sunset coming from that direction shortly. <laughs> Okay, right, that's it. Um, now look, I had all sorts of plans today. I got a friend of mine who uh, I got to bring a drone here to Barcelona. We were going to film, um, go off into into town and, and film some skateboarding whilst I talk about the uh, the Grand Prix this weekend and what to expect. Obviously, that's not going to happen. So now, what you're going to get is me talking about the Grand Prix whilst I go clothes and laptop charger shopping. <laughs> Uh, right, so the Barcelona Grand Prix, the Spanish Grand Prix, um, what to expect? Well, normally we would come here, the first race of the European season, uh, where everyone's bringing upgrades, because um, they've all been back to the factory. It's much easier logistically to get uh, a constant flow of parts and updates from the, the European-based factories to the European races, of course, and this is the first of those. So. We fully expect uh, lots of people to bring upgrades, but normally we come here saying that look, Barcelona's a track where we've done all our pre-season testing, uh, we've been testing there for years, so everyone knows it inside out. Slightly different this year, because all the pre-season testing, of course, not only was done in bitterly cold conditions, trying to avoid the snowy days, but also the track surface had been completely relayed ahead of pre-season testing. So, Actually, with the very limited running and, and not very meaningful running we had done, and we got done back in February, uh, no one really has a clear handle on what the new track surface will do to the tyres in the conditions that we face here in May. It's a circuit that really tests out a Formula One car in many ways. Um, three sectors, of course, of this track, like every other. The first two sectors here in Barcelona uh, are medium to high speed with some really fast flowing corners. Um, you really need a car that is very, very good around the fast flowing tracks and uh, you know, actually what you really want is a car with a great top speed uh, and a great high speed grip levels uh, and a great change of direction at speed. Um, and then you come into the third and final sector where it's actually the opposite of that. It's much slower, it's tighter and twistier, um, slow corners and much slower speed. You want very high downforce uh, for, those sector, for that sector. And it's that sector really where most of that time is won and lost. And so for that reason, we tend to see cars coming here or teams coming here with actually quite a high downforce setup. Whereas for probably half the lap or more, not actually what you really want is not the highest downforce and, and therefore highest drag setup. But most of that time is won and lost in the final sector. That's why the teams will go for that option. In terms of the demands uh, on a Formula One car around here, uh, I guess in terms of braking, it's reasonably average. Uh, in terms of fuel um, consumption, also pretty average. Uh, I think around about one and a half kilos of fuel per lap, maybe just over from memory. Um, uh, ERS demands, actually reasonably high. Um, there are two pretty long straights, or substantial enough straights, where you want full deployment of the ERS system. Uh, so reasonably high or, or tough on that area of the power unit um, but this one is all about understanding how these tyres these Pirelli tyres which are so temperature sensitive are going to work on this brand new track surface that we haven't really got very much data to compare to uh, historically from all the, the data that we've, we've collected over the years from coming here. Friday is going to be interesting not only because they're going to be working that out but they're also going to be assessing all of the new bits and new aero upgrades and parts that they've brought. McLaren are rumoured to be bringing something incredibly substantial, a very, very different car almost, to the one that we've seen for the first four races. It's going to be fascinating to watch. This is definitely not as much fun on foot as it is on the skateboard. It's not the most easy circuit to overtake on, which on paper doesn't bode well, although the first four races have proven that Actually, there can be other factors that really spice up a race. Um, the reason it's difficult to overtake around here is because coming onto the main straight, the fastest part of the circuit, leading into that, the final corner of the lap is a really fast, sweeping corner where you're going at high speed and relying on maximum aero to keep the car planted. If you're following another car, we all know too well that following cars too closely in modern Formula One you lose all of that downforce or a huge chunk of it and therefore along with it a, number, a, a huge amount of your grip. Um, now if you can't follow a car closely through that final corner 
heading on to the final uh, the start finish straight that's your best overtaking opportunity that long start finish straight if you can't stick with him through the final corner what chance have you got to try and overtake DRS of course does some way go some way to overcoming that but the fact is you're so far behind by the time you get onto that uh, that final straight or that start finish straight that actually the overtaking opportunities are few and far between perfect electric skateboarding territory I mean perfect I can't tell you how frustrated I am <laughs> Um, I know I said I'd calm down, but I haven't. I'm still angry. I just walked all the way up and down this town. I can't find anywhere that sells an. Uh, there's no Apple store. Can't find anywhere to sell a for, to buy a new laptop charger. This first race of the European season. It's the first time that they bring their motorhomes. Um, we still call them motorhomes. They're not motorhomes at all. They're giant, uh, semi-permanent buildings that are erected. I mean, McLaren's. Uh, I, I may have got this wrong, but most McLaren's brand center as they call it a great big palace that sits in the center of the paddock comes to barcelona or comes to every grand prix on something like 17 different trucks you know it's enormous it has a huge number of people putting it up in the week before a grand prix and then of course taking it down from sunday night so huge operation it means there'll be a lot more people in the paddock this weekend a lot of new people in the paddock that haven't been here so far this season, so it'd be great to see all of those guys. It also gives us a nice place to kind of hang out uh, over the weekend, to watch the race from as media. We're welcomed into most of these motorhomes, which is lovely. We, we can enjoy their hospitality. It's a really nice benefit, something that uh, we're all very grateful for, uh, to the teams for allowing us to share in that. Although I just said what I said about the, the sort of lack of, historic lack of overtaking here, um, I would not write this off as being a dull race just yet. Anything can happen, we've proven that in the first four races, and I fully expect, there's absolutely no reason not to expect, similar kind of things to happen again this weekend. So don't take your eyes off Formula One for a moment. By the way, there's a very good chance that this weekend will be affected at some point by rain. <laughs>